Good morning, welcome. Uh, today is Wednesday, September 24, 2014, and you are at the Parks, Arts, Transparency, and Education Subcommittee. So I will be uh, calling this meeting to order. Uh, does anybody have a approval of the June 25th, 2014 meeting minutes? Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nobody nay. Thank you. Items three through six, as you will see on the screen, are for information only. Uh, we will have the Parks and Recreation Board update, and before I move forward to that, I need to introduce Judy. I just realized that. We have a translator here. See, si alguien necesita traducción en español, or para en español, I Judy. Nadie? Okay, gracias. Items three through six are for information only. As you can see, as you can see, uh, you, there, you, there's the agenda of the Parks and Recre Recreation Board tentative upcoming agenda. And then uh, you have the Head Start monthly uh, report, May. June and July, and there's information of where you can find it on the website, and also a telephone number if needed. Items seven through eight are for consent. Uh, no presentations are planned. However, there's staff here, if anybody would like anything. So, seven and eight, all those, and is there a motion? No? Nope. Move approval. No, oh, we don't need, go ahead. What's that? Well, these are for consent, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I'll, sec I'll okay. second. I'll just mention that one is for a Fit, Fit Phoenix grant request, which mm -hmm. is obviously incredibly important. And it's an initiative that we were able to, to start uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and we're reaching, the goal is to reach every demographic, every person, regardless of abilities or diversities, to uh, encourage to live a healthier, safer lifestyle and uh, together become the healthiest city Phoenix can be. Uh, and so I will second the motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I just. <laughs> uh, item number nine reallocation of Head Start slots. Chairwoman Pastor and subcommittee members, we have Deanna Janovich and Mo Gallego um, from our Human Services Department as well as staff to give an update on this report. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much uh, for uh, the opportunity to speak to you today on the reallocation of uh, Head Start slots. Um, the, uh, what we have before you is uh, the Murphy Head Start program, uh, who is uh, requesting to uh, relinquish uh, 48 slots from the program. Uh, this came in two phases. Originally, they came to us and said that they were struggling with enrollment and uh, requested to remove uh, 34 slots uh, from their program. Uh, we were able to move quickly because neither one of those uh, classrooms had been opened, and so we were able to move the entire classrooms to uh, other areas uh, and have uh, done so. Uh, after that, a few weeks ago, they requested to uh, relinquish two more classrooms. However, those two classrooms had already been opened and started, and so we already had children placed into those slots. Head Start uh, performance standards will not allow um, uh, once children are already enrolled and services are being provided, Head Start regulations will not allow any kind of disenrollment or unenrollment of children. We cannot stop services to them. And so the only slots that were vacant from those classrooms that they were struggling uh, with were 14 additional slots, and that's how we get to the uh, 48 slots. Uh, we are proposing to uh, put the slots at the Isaac, Cartwright, and Alhambra school districts. They were selected because they have the lowest percentage of eligible children being served. Uh, they have classroom capacity. They have wait lists where we can uh, start up children right away. Uh, this is how the allocation would occur. 
uh, five slots in Alhambra at the J.R. Rice School. The Greater Phoenix Urban League is the delegate agency that administers the program in the Isaac School District. We would place 20 slots there at PT Co. Uh, Greater Phoenix Urban League is again the delegate agency that uh, administers a program in Cartwright Peralta, and we would put 23 slots at that program. So, uh, Madam Chair, members of the uh, subcommittee, we are uh, requesting uh, subcommittee uh, approval uh, to uh, reallocate 48 slots from the Murphy School District program to the Greater Phoenix Urban League and Alhambra delegate agencies and increase those contracts appropriately uh, 198,172 for Greater Phoenix Urban League and 21,921 for the Alhambra Delegate Agency. And this is for the current period of July 1, 2014 through June 30th, 2015. And uh, really that concludes the presentation. If you have any questions for us. Are there any questions? Any card? I have no cards on nine. I'll make, a motion. I'll make a motion to approve staff's recommendation on item number nine. There's a second. All those in favor? Aye. The motion moves, passes. Thank you. Item number 10 is information on Head Start costs per child funding proposal. This is for information and discussion. And uh, Moses. I'll have you present and then we'll go. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this item, uh, Madam Chair, member of the subcommittee, is a result of your, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, of your April 2014 subcommittee meeting uh, where a discussion uh, took place about the way that we fund delegate agencies and the methodology and uh, the, of the cost per child that, that we allocate uh, to the uh, model. So we are worked over the summer uh, to try to work on that issue, and we are bringing back uh, to you today for your information and discussion uh, only uh, at this point uh, the results of that work. Uh, before I get into that, though, I want to just put into context at a very high level the, the Head Start program and how it relates to us. Uh, we are uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is a funding agency from the federal government that works through the Office of Head Start. We get Head Start funds directly to us as a grantee. We have been a grantee since 1965, one of the oldest, uh, certainly in the state and, and across the nation. Uh, we have historically had city contracts with area nonprofits and school districts, we call them delegate agencies, to provide the instructional services of the program. Uh, the Head Start program is made up of the classroom services and also the social services. We, as the grantee, as in the city of Phoenix, we administer uh, all the social services to all uh, 3,000 plus slots. We also have the monitoring, the oversight, and the very specific areas of expertise such as mental health, uh, nutrition, uh, health, and those areas. Uh, the funding levels that we have currently with delegate agencies was determined in 1999 uh, when the city established cost reimbursement contracts. Uh, they were negotiated individually with each of the delegate agencies uh, they were negotiated based upon the varying costs and different structures that were in place at that time. Uh, as a result of that work, and since then, the cost per child currently ranges from $3,904 at the low end to $6,948 at the high end. Uh, basically, in the Head Start world, uh, funding only changes in very few instances. One is the expansion of slots. If there are additional slots that the federal government is putting out, and we were to receive them, that might change a cost per child uh, amount. Cost of living increases occasionally occur, and then sometimes slots are reallocated, such as the example that we just went through with the Murphy School District. Before I talk about the new model or the proposed model, uh, what I would like to uh, do is uh, thank and, and really acknowledge all of the hard work of our delegate agency directors and their staff. Uh, we had many uh, meetings over the summer. Uh, the, many times they were attended by superintendents from schools, by board members from some of the nonprofits, uh, by financial uh, personnel from the various delegate agencies were of course interested in the, the conversation that we were having. Uh, so that was very good participation. Difficult conversation, but excellent participation. Uh, the new model, is really based upon 
uh, common cost per child is based on the size of the program. So the larger the program, uh, actually the more efficiencies uh, with a number, higher number of classrooms, there's more opportunity to deal with uh, specific admin costs, and so you have greater efficiencies. So the costs change as the larger the agency grows. Uh, small delegate agencies have always assisted us in ensuring that we have geographic distribution throughout our program, something that is very important and something that we would uh, always be watching for. But as we did this extensive analysis and work uh, that was performed, uh, it became apparent that as a result of the analysis that the financial feasibility really begins when you're at least 204 slots or greater. That is the opportunity where admin costs really make it uh, uh, easier to manage the program. It does not it mean that below that you cannot manage it, you can. We have examples of that happening already. But that in the future, should we uh, move to this model, uh, it is something that we would want to look at as we would uh, look at any new delegate agencies. As a result, uh, the cost uh, per child ranges from uh, $4,900, recognizing smaller agencies may require more funding, uh, all the way up or all the way down to $4,500 for larger agencies that I will show you uh, in just one moment. As far as the impact of the model, uh, it results in, it would result in five delegate agencies receiving increased funding. Four delegate agencies would receive uh, technical, uh, would receive decreased funding. Um, two of these delegate agencies have indicated that they can make this model work. Two of them are uh, trying to work with it. Are someone struggling? We have been providing technical assistance and will continue to provide any and all assistance to any and all of the delegate agencies uh, that need our help. Uh, should the model be implemented and should there be delegate agencies that either could not proceed or, or didn't wish to proceed, a request for proposal uh, would be required uh, if we had areas that weren't covered because we are, of course, committed to covering the entire city uh, uh, throughout our, our program. Uh, this is a very high overview of the uh, of breaks. Uh, as oh, We're going to yes. take a, a pause okay. because we're switching out headsets so that uh, the whole audience can uh, listen to the discussion. So thank you. Judy, are we ready? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee. So the, this is a high-level uh, overview of the uh, funding uh, structure, the levels. Uh, what it is is uh, if there are six to 10 classrooms, 102 to 170 slots, uh, the cost per child that we would uh, propose is $4,900. As the program grows to 12 to 18 uh, classes, uh, 204 to 306 slots, 4,800, and then it drops uh, to 4,700, 4,600, 4,500. This model could go on out. This particular uh, model here covers all the delegate agencies as they exist today. So we stopped at this point so you could see that snapshot. This is the actual outcome should the model be implemented based upon the structure that we started this school year with and that we currently have. Uh, the, as I indicated earlier, five of the delegate agencies would uh, show an increase in their funding, uh, four of them decreases. Uh, Deer Valley uh, School District and the Greater Phoenix Urban League have indicated that while they have uh, reduced funding, they could make this model work. Uh, Booker T. Washington and uh, Wilson uh, School Districts are trying to, uh, Bosa School District is trying to work on this model. I uh, just want to say that the effort of Booker T. Washington has been uh, really, uh, really spectacular in my opinion as we've tried to work with them. So this is uh, the impact that the model would have should we implement it. 
and should it be implemented based upon the way we exist today? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, again, this is for, uh, for your information and for di your discussion. Uh, we hope to bring this back uh, item back to you in October, uh, unless we get uh, direction otherwise, uh, to continue the discussion and hopefully move to a decision. And with that, that concludes the presentation. Uh, answer any questions whenever you're ready. I think what I'm going to do, would, if my colleagues don't mind, I'm going to go to uh, the speaker comment cards first, and then after that we can ask questions. So, uh, Claudia Chavez. Hay dos minutos para hablar sobre este título. Claudia? Okay. Hola, buenos días buenos a todos días. y cada uno de ustedes aquí presentes. Mi nombre es Claudia Chávez y estoy aquí en representación de Folder Hester Program para decirles gracias por resolver favorablemente el regresar a Hester las aulas faltantes. Thank you very much for my name is Claudia Chávez and I thank you for listening to us and I wanted to thank you for giving us the slots that uh, we needed. Siendo este un beneficio absoluto para nuestros niños, los cuales son el futuro del mundo. This is for the benefit of our children that are the future of the world. En, gracias por la atención que me están dando y si pueden ser favorablemente a este problema, resolverlo como siempre lo hacen. Thank you very much for resolving this problem and I wish you can resolve it as you have always done that. Gracias y que tengan un bonito día. Que Dios les bendiga siempre. Thank you. Have a nice day and may God bless you always. Amen. I want to ask, uh, did, I think she mentioned that she's with Fowler or Child Goes to Fowler. Is that correct? ¿De dónde eres, mija? No, de qué escuela? ¿De qué escuela? Fowler Head Start. Fowler Head Start. Okay. Uh, Alma Martinez. Um, buenos días. Uh, mi nombre es Alma Martínez. Uh, antes que nada, gracias por la oportunidad que me dan para hablar aquí. Um, My name is Alma Martínez. Thank you for this opportunity to talk here. Um, uh, tengo dos hijos, uno en Kinder y uno en Gestar. Um, y quiero darles las gracias por el programa de Gestar porque estoy muy contenta con los avances que he visto en mis hijos. Uh, creo que es una el tener Gestar es un, una oportunidad muy grande para los niños para llegar al kinder y no tener uh, problemas cuando I have, llegan. I have two children. I have one in kindergarten and one in Head Start and it is a great opportunity for the kids to be able to go to this program because they can prepare themselves very good to, to move to kindergarten. Porque sé que cuando llegan a kinder y no han tenido una preparación de gestar, uh, muchas veces los cambian a clases donde no, no están tan avanzados. Y if, esas clases... If they go from kindergarten to head start, if they go to kindergarten without head start, it is very hard because they don't allocate the children in a place, they put them in different classrooms. Esas clases los atrasan mucho y sabemos que en el estado, el estado de Arizona es uno de los estados más bajos académicamente. Y and y and they, they go way behind in the classroom if you don't put them in the right classroom. And we know the state of Arizona is one of the states that is having a hard time with the children in the schools. Y el programa de Gestar les ofrece más ayuda a los niños para que puedan aprender de una manera 
adaptarse más bien a, a, al kinder de una manera fácil, práctica y de una manera divertida sin que and, se les haga. And the program of Head Start helps children to adapt and to learn in a in a fun way and they learn more like that. Es todo, gracias y Thank agradezco que nos hayan regresado los salones uh, para Gestar y espero que también nos ayuden con el Fondo Económico para los Niños. Thank you for helping us by giving us more classrooms for get Head Start and for giving us more financial help for the children. Gracias. Once again, is that Fowler also? Fowler. 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 Uh, Vincent Medina. Good morning. You have two minutes. Two minutes, perfect. Um, good morning, I'm Vince Medina, director of the Head Start program with Fowler School District. Um, this morning, I would like to thank the members of the subcommittee for allowing me this very short time to speak. Thank you, Pat and Mo, it's good to see you both. Uh, my message is very short. Um, the, dele the delegate directors in the city of Phoenix um, have worked very hard this summer um, to develop a plan to make the cost per child more equitable. Where it may not be the perfect plan, we are on a pathway to making it more equitable. I would like to thank the delegate directors and the City of Phoenix administration for making this possible. One of the things that I would like to emphasize is that, um, and I know my colleague from Wilson, I'm not sure if she's here, but with the reduction in funding, it's quite possible that we may lose the administrative support and I know the city of Phoenix has been very proactive in addressing this very issue. However, I just would like for us to keep our eyes on this issue as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Marvin Lobato from Fowler, right? Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marvin Lobato, superintendent for Fowler Elementary School District, and I'm here this morning to First of all, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much for listening to our concerns last spring in the area of sequestration as well as cost per child. I also would like to thank um, Mr. Gallegos, and Ms. Nightingale, and Mr. Hill. Had it not been for your direction to them, um, all the work that was done this summer would have gone by the wayside. They have worked diligently with our directors. They have allowed our input. They have had critical questions asked of them and come back. We have what I feel is a true a line of communication that is now open that I thought we had lost last year. Um, so with that, I'm very grateful for the direction that was given to the Human Services Department and how they have extended that to our delegate agencies. Um, I would also like to thank you for the sequestration restoration um, slots. It allowed us to have our three-year-old program back. Um, and anybody's welcome at any time to come see that program. Um, last but not least, I know the issue of the cost per child is very delicate. And I definitely um, feel as though we're headed in the right direction. I know that all of us will um, work together to make sure that all students that are given a slot are given the quality education they deserve. And I can only tell you that one of the areas we're excited about, possibly in the um, years to come, is the Great Start program that we partnered with this summer. And I hope each of you on the subcommittee received your thank you from Fowler, letting you know that we are indebted to you for supporting that Great Start program, which we hope we can expand um, for more Head Start children to have an opportunity this coming summer. So with that, I just want to say thank you again to the subcommittee. Thank you again to the Human Services Department. James Thompson. Good morning. Good morning. Justice? Yeah. Good morning. My name is James Thompson, and I represent Booker T. Washington. Um, personally, I am opposed to the budget cut. Uh, I have seen the transformation in the lives of the students, the teachers, and the parents and the families of Booker T. Washington. The value and integrity of Booker T. Washington is more than words can say. With over 50 years of excellence, it is important that this success be continued. I'm concerned about the future of this program. It is a huge possibility that many Head Start slots will be eliminated. I ask of you to do away with the cut. There has to be another way. The future of our children depends on it. Thank you. Cassandra Wright.
<laughs> Got your hands full there, huh? Yes, I do. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. My name is Cassandra Wright, and I'm a grandparent and a co-parent for my grandchildren. And I'm here on behalf of Booker T. Washington. I want to say, first of all, good morning. And I want you to know that um, each dollar that is spent at Booker T. Washington is used to ensure the quality of education um, for each child. Um, it is important that our community keeps Booker T. Washington there because it not only impacts the lives of our little ones, it impacts the lives of us as adults as well. Um, Booker T. Washington has been there for over four decades, and I think that alone speaks for itself. And my um, issue and concern was that the cut is a tremendous amount. It is an amount that would make an impact not only on the community, but our children. We don't, um, looking at the budget, me and some of the other parents and going over some of the um, things that are important to us. Um, we noticed that um, with the um, budget at Booker T. Washington, it's not geared toward um, salaries, it's not geared toward the retirement plan, it's geared toward the quality that is put into the education, preparing our children for kindergarten. Um, most of the children that do um, graduate from Booker T. Washington and go on to kindergarten are very well prepared. Not only are they prepared, but they have a, a drive to succeed. They are, um, they stand out. And we just ask that council men and council women that you really take a look at the budget and find another way to um, make this um, cut and let it not be so tremendous because it's going to be a devastating effect. I don't know what that beeping is, but I think that's my cue. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Alba Quintana. Good morning. My name is Alba Quintana. I am a teacher from Booker T. Washington since four years ago. I started as a kindergarten uh, teacher in the Phoenix um, District Number One, and um, I can see the difference when the child attends Head Start. You can see they learn faster. They uh, are more advanced than the one that don't attend Head Start. Um, also. Um, those the ones that attend in Hester, they can, they are the peer models for the ones that didn't attend. They help each other. It's a, it's a, um, a very important when they attend attend Hester. Um, my child, I am a for, former parent. My child is in kinder right now. She attended two. She attended two years of Hester. She's a, an advanced child, and I'm very happy that um, she was able to stay for two years. In Hester, in this Hester program, um, I like to be at Booker T. Washington because they have, um, they support us, they support the teacher, they support the parents, they support the teacher assistants. Um, I'm happy working there, and it's going to be very hard if the budget is cut. We need the money, we need um, materials for the kids, we need those resources. That resource, that budget is very important for us. Um, I hope doesn't happen. Um, I hope uh, maybe they can make another arrangement about it. And um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Catherine uh, Angelus. Good morning. Um, I'm here as a parent. My son is in Head Start program at Booger T. Washington District at uh, Garfield School. Um, that's his teacher right over there. Um, I am opposed to this uh, budget change. I, it seems that there's a disproportionate amount of um, funding being taken away from Booger T. Washington. And um, 
it's easy to look at numbers and talk in those kinds of terms, but in the end, the only ones being negatively impacted are the kids. And so it's, uh, it's really unfortunate, and I hope that this can be looked at in a more comprehensive way, and um, we can come to some kind of solution, because um, I know every one of the kids in my son's class is beautiful and um, intelligent and deserves the best. And so, yeah, thank you, and I hope this gets resolved and discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Veronica. Veronica. Can't read that. Okay. Gracias. Si puedes decir su nombre allí. Good morning. My name is Veronica Garcia. I am actually opposed to this budget cut as well. I do have two children at Booker. Well, I had one last year at Booker T, and I have one currently at Booker T. And I have noticed the great impact that the Head Start has had on my kids. Um, Garfield usually tests the, uh, before they start kindergarten. I'm so grateful that they didn't have to test my son since they saw the results that Booker T had provided for them. I think that cutting budget will be really inappropriate for the kids um, because like everybody else has mentioned, Booker T is there for the kids, not for themselves, and they pay attention to the parents. They go forward and talk to you if you need any help. And I honestly think that if there was any other way that anything could be resolved and look, be looked at so the kids won't be impacted at the end of the night or at the end of the day, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nora. Nora. Cha Nora. Chavera. Chavero. Um, hi, good morning. My name is Nora Chavero. And I'm a parent at Booker T. Washington. Also, I'm the rep for the Policy Council. <laughs> so I was saying, I'm a parent. I have four kids. And I still remember mm, the first day of school of my oldest. His excitement, that hunger for learning. Oh, he was so ready to go to Head Start, and so I was. So I was. It was my break for me. I have four kids, so it was hard. I wasn't involved. I want no importance on Head Start. So my kid, he wasn't learning. He was the bully on his class. You know, it was hard for me until his teacher, he talked to me. He said, Nora, this is important. This is the base for your child's education. You need to do something. And I did it. I get involved. I care for my child's education. I went to all the meetings, all the trainings. And I see. I saw the difference. I did. I did. Now he's on second grade. He is doing great. He's on top of his class. His teachers love him. His classmates, they love him. He's doing great. Head Start not only do the impact on my kids. It also did it on me. And I wasn't even a student. I always knew my kids that they can fly high as they come. I didn't have any tool for that until Head Start. Now I can support my kids. Now I care for the education. And they want to get as high as they want because there are no limits. There are no limits with a good education and a parent's involvement. So for that, and because I know the quality of Booker T. Washington, and I know what a great impact they're going to do on all these parents, I'm here not only to represent my child, but for each child at Booker T. Washington, for each child at all the delegate agencies. And I ask you, please, seek more questions more options. Thank you. Thank you for your time Gracias and God bless you. Maria Aradondo. Yeah. Buenos días. Good morning. Yes. Mi nombre es Maria y vengo de la escuela Book Washington. I, I am Maria, and I come from the Booker Y estoy en contra de que le quiten los fondos al, al programa. And I am against 
for you to remove the funds from the program? Porque mis niñas, bueno, ya no tengo niñas en el salón, pero tengo mis sobrinas y a mis hijas les ha servido mucho el programa. Han aprendido mucho, entraron con muchas ganas al kinder y pues ya sabían algo. I don't have children here anymore, but I have nieces and, and they have learned a lot. My children were there and they learned a lot in this program. Y nomás puedes pedirles que por favor no le quiten los fondos al programa. I just wanted to ask you not to remove the funds from the program. Y gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Michael Johnson. Thank you. Can I lift this up some? You know, I, um, first of all, I'll thank you for uh, taking this opportunity. I do want to say that uh, for me, this is very personal and, and dear as I listen to uh, all of these parents uh, talk because I know and I understand that issue of having to have the opportunity to have your kids go to a Head Start program for pre-education. I've always been a supporter of a Head Start. I'm, I'm very concerned about you know these impacts. And as we talk about uh, the budget and, and cutting the budget and, and reducing it down, it almost eliminates the fight with the federal government to talk about the money we receive from the federal government per pupil for Head Start, that we receive less money for our Head Start programs than the average students across the nation receives. This is playing more into that role of doing the same thing that we're receiving less funds to be able to do that. But I always thought that we were about the quality of education that we're able to provide those kids. I'm very sensitive to uh, Booker T. Washington because I had two kids that went to Head Start. But at that time, the Head Start program was in the projects. They went upstairs to a classroom. They got out of that program and they went to St. Matthews. And right now, you know, my son's doing a career in the military. My daughter has a doctor's degree. She just passed, you know, her bar, her state uh, uh, test to be a licensed psychiatrist. And I'm telling you that the quality of education is just as important as the quantity and the cost that you have. And Booger T. Washington is providing quality service and I think that before you make such a drastic cut I would strongly request that uh, you reconsider this and have them look at all of those issues because that is uh, an important issue this is the Head Start program I think located right in the lowest social economic area of the city that has started to grow from Garfield uh, surrounded by three public housing projects that these parents have. I think those parents that follow, you know, the same thing. I, I, I just know the importance of, of that, of those programs, but a drastic loss in funding to this degree would be devastating to the educational impact of those young people in those areas. So I would strongly encourage you to, to relook at it and find ways to mitigate such strong cuts in services. Thank you. Dr. Laverne Tarkington? Um, do you have a daughter-in-law that teaches at Coronado High School or is a principal? Pleasure meeting her. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today. My name is Laverne Swain Tarkington, lifelong member of the Phoenix community and product of the Booker T. Washington community and member of the Booker T. Washington Head Start Board of Directors. I was appointed to represent the board today. Booker T. Washington began in uh, 1967 in the bill in the basement of uh, First Institutional Baptist Church, also a proud member. This program has operated effectively and efficiently for close to 50 years. That ought to mean something to the members of the city council. We are concerned with the method used to determine the cost per child in the Head Start programs as outlined in the chart 
that was given uh, on the nine delegates. I hope that you have received that chart by now. In the chart prepared by the City of Phoenix, the nine delegates uh, were represented, but the actual cost per child was not given for all of the programs. And I would draw your attention to the fact that Booker T. Washington is the only one that has identified all areas. Booker T. Washington is the only standalone nonprofit agency of all the nine de uh, delegate programs, therefore responsible for all costs incurred for operating a Head Start program. The same cost for those items such as accounting, auditing, training, fa uh, facility maintenance, uh, insurance, and on and on, exists for all of those programs. In the case of Booker T. Washington, there is no other entity to assume that cost. City of Phoenix is our parent agency, and they do not fold in that cost as part of their responsibility. If we knew the cost of the other programs, uh, other delegates, we would know the cost per child and then be able to look at it appropriately. We have another chart that uh, you've been given that analyzes the cost based on what we do know side by side with the other delegates. It is apparent that Booker T. Washington is higher in five of the, uh, uh, of the areas, um, five of the nine delegates. This is to show that we are not out of line. We ask that you consider this because as a viable program that must be saved, you must look at all of the costs to provide quality education for all of the children in the Phoenix area. Corporate America is looking at us based on the quality of education in Phoenix. Please don't let our children down. Thank you. Uh, Veronica Garcia? Veronica. Veronica? Oh. Oh. Buenos días. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, mi nombre es Verónica Carrizal y nada más vengo para pedirles que estoy en contra del corte de fondos que quieren hacer y yo pienso que esto está mal lo que quieren hacer porque lo que quieren hacer es un mal para los niños. Los niños lo necesitan mucho. Yo tengo cinco niños y cuatro han estado desde el, desde el grado de gestar y los cuatro les ha ayudado mucho. Y la más grande va baja en, en, pues en todo. Este, y yo pienso que, que no es justo que se los quiten porque pues dinero hay. El problema es por qué se los quieren quitar. Um, I am Verónica Carrizal. ¿De qué escuela eres? De Booker. I am from Booker T. Washington, and I am against this uh, cutting of the um, classrooms. It is very bad for the children. I have five children myself. Four of my children went to the Head Start program, and they are doing really good. But the oldest girl, she's, she's lowering her grades. Um, yo pienso que a los niños este, les sirve mucho desde empezar desde Gestar porque ellos aprenden más y, y entre más este, recursos tengan las maestras, más ayudan a los niños y los niños aprenden más gracias a las maestras que le tienen paciencia y pues los niños aprenden más gracias a ellas y, y pues no es justo que les quiten los, los fondos a los al, pues a las maestras, ¿verdad? Porque de ellas dependen los niños que ellas aprendan más. Also, I, I would like to, um, that's why I'm against this, and uh, we need more resources for the children and for the teachers. The teachers uh, need these resources so they can help more the children and they have more patience with the children and we don't want you to remove this. Um, Class. Bueno, es todo. Gracias. And this is it. Gracias. Thank you. That's all. Jerry Martinez. Jerry Martinez. In favor. Okay. Uh, Juan Carlos Perez. Juan Carlos Perez. Opposed. En contra. Uh, Hope Edwards. Hope Edwards. Oh, there she is. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. you. Good morning, my name is Jerry Martinez. I'm the director of the 
Head Start program in the Alhambra School District, located in West Phoenix. We serve 476 children in our program each day. Those children are served by 14 certified teachers who del deliver highly um, effective instruction in 28 double sessions every day. The number of children we serve represents 26% of the eligible population of preschool children who would be income eligible for Head Start services in our community. We have one of the lowest cost per child reimbursements in the City of Phoenix Head Start program. Our actual um, cost per child reimbursement is $4,384 per year. <coughs> In the past five years, we've been forced to make deep cuts in our budget in order to balance the budget. The cuts have included eliminating transportation, eliminating field trips, and eliminating the long-standing tradition of teachers sitting at table sharing a meal with children in family-style meal service. Our teachers still sit with children, but they don't partake of the meal. We've reached a place that there are no more cuts that we can take. We've cut everything that can be cut without impacting quality. So I urge you to consider the proposal before you today. If you were to approve it, it would mean an additional $316 per year per child to the Alhambra budget. That's an amount that I think you would agree is not an exorbitant amount when you add it to $4,384 for the services that we're providing. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And again, I urge you to um, consider the, the proposal carefully and consider approving it for the good of all children in the community. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe this is hope. Okay. Good morning to the committee. My name is Hope Edwards. I'm the director for the Wilson Head Start program. I'd like to first begin by thanking you for allowing the sequestered slots to remain in the Wilson community. Um, and secondly, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to speak about the cost per child. Wilson Head Start is currently the smallest delegate under the city of Phoenix with 132 children. Although through this new model, we'll receive a few hundred dollars more per child than the other delegates. We will still feel a huge impact with the loss of $28,000. We're a small delegate in a small school district with very limited funding and resources. So as costs have continued to rise over the years, our funding has decreased or remained um, just stagnant. All programs are expected to comply to over 2,000 performance standards, no matter what the size of the program. The reduction will cause our program to lose key personnel staff. The model proposed will not provide funding to our program to ensure that this support remains intact. Wilson's quality will definitely be at risk. During the most recent cost per child discussions with the city of Phoenix, um, I spoke about several areas that will definitely be at a deficit if this decision is to occur. At this time, I would like to state clearly that Wilson Head Start will need additional support from the city of Phoenix in which to maintain a quality program if this decision is to be passed. We'll need help in order to maintain quality, meet required deadlines, adhere to the Head Start performance standards, and to continue to help children to be ready for school. I am asking this committee to ensure that the needed support is provided leading to a strong program, leading to greater success for children and families of the Wilson community. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Anna Vivello. Good morning, my name is Ana Vivello. I'm in against of the, the cut. Um, I'm a teacher of Bacati, Washington, and I'm very proud of my parents coming in here today and talk. You had the opportunity to see two parents today and trying to understand and coming here, talk to you about this cut, how it's gonna affect the children. I'm in here to talk to you about the teachers, how we feel about this cut that we can have in this in this Bacati uh, School Washington. 
and and I'm also you, I want you to understand how proud I am that you're not changing only the children, but the parents, the family. We are providing services just for, not just for the children, but for the family too. And I want you to understand how proud I am about these parents coming in here and talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lucretia McKee. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm also a Booker T. Washington parent. I just want to very simply say I think that the cut that is proposed is a very, very deep cut, and I'd like you to reconsider. Um, Arizona is already in the spotlight for um, issues with cost per child or you know the money that is put into education. I think that that should be considered. And I think what should be considered also is that Booker T. Washington as she stated, is a nonprofit organization. Booker T. Washington covers everything, even paper towels, even cups, toothpaste, toothbrushes, every single thing. And that is not so for uh, the other um, organizations. So just keep that in mind. We need the funds. It doesn't have to be such a deep cut. It's so huge, so astronomical. It's huge. I can't believe it. I can't even believe you came up with that number, to be honest. So reconsider, and I think it's a, it's a very simple thing. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen Flores. Mi nombre es Karen Flores. Aquí estoy representando no nada más a mi hijo y a mi hija. Um, soy madre de una niña de tres años y un joven de 14 años que hoy está en el nueve grado. Y mi hijo no fue al gestar y es mucha la diferencia, como dijo la maestra de los niños que van a gestar y los niños que no van. Mi niño... My name is Karen Flores, and... ¿De qué escuela eres? I am from Booker T. Washington, and I have um, my children. I have one daughter that she is three years old, and, f and another that is 14 years old. And I can see the difference of the one that goes <coughs> to Head Start, and my other uh, child didn't went to Head Start, and I can see the big difference. Okay, con mi hijo no me involucré en el Head Start, y sí es mucha la diferencia porque es un joven bueno, pero a, aparte de eso, yo estoy aquí representando no nada más a mis hijos, como les dije, a los, a los hijos futuros de padres, que tal vez hoy no pudieron estar aquí por cualquier razón, pero allá afuera hay muchos padres como yo que están preocupados por el recorte. Yo estoy muy en contra de eso. Y I am I I didn't get involved with the education of my son, but uh, I am not only representing my children, but I am also representing the children of many other parents that are outside and the parents. Es muy simple. Si queremos un Arizona con mi nivel académico más alto, debemos de, de educar desde un principio a los niños. No debemos recortarles el futuro desde que están chiquitos, porque desde ahí comienza todo. Uh, and it, in Arizona, we shouldn't be cutting the level of the children. We should be supporting them and having them to have a better level in Arizona, in the state of Arizona. Es todo, gracias. And this is everything. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. So Natalie McWhorter uh, does not want to speak, but is in favor. Michelle Pillsbury is in favor, just does, chooses not to speak. And Diana Housden is in favor and has chosen not to speak. So um, we are now opening up to discussions to my colleagues and uh, who would like to go first with their questions? Anyone? Um, I have some questions. Does the chart that I just received, um, in looking at, at all of this, did we take into account all the, really the true cost per child? Yes, let me explain that 
where you have blanks here, it does not mean that there are no costs. What these are are costs that are being charged to the Head Start program. So as an example, if there's no facility costs labeled there, it doesn't mean there's no costs. It's just they're not being charged to Head Start. So there could be costs, but they're being covered by the school district or by some other method uh, as an in-kind. So the blanks here are not, not that there are no costs. It's just that all the costs that are being charged to the Head Start program by delegate agency are listed here. Okay, so then I'm going to rephrase my question, maybe I, to get to where I need to get to. So what I'm hearing is, uh, say, one of the school districts uh, charges their cost to Head Start, but the additional costs are in-kind. Um, they're being in-kind to the district, or the district is paying for that cost. Yes, uh, okay. ma Madam Chairman, so as an example, uh, one agency may have uh, a cost for uh, landscaping that have to be covered, and another agency may have that landscaping already being done by their agency. So, you know, that, that you're exactly right. And, and so then, I could just add, this was an analysis of why the costs were different. So when we talk about that we negotiated the cost um, back in 2000, it was looking at this, um, these kinds of operation costs. Who needed to pay for um, their uh, utilities and who wouldn't have to pay for utilities? And that's how we got the different um, costs per child. And this was sort of um, our analysis of trying to figure out um, what the justification was for why there was varying costs per child, just to put it in context of how we used it. So. I um, guess I'm still kind of, because there's a big difference between, I guess where I'm going is there's a difference between a nonprofit serving the community versus a school district, because the school district also has additional funds that come into uh, Title IX and Title III, all these different funds that are able to cover some of these things. So I would like to look at the true cost per child. And what I'm saying is uh, I would like to look at what in kind, what the school districts are giving in kind. Is that possible? Well, Madam Chair, not without ex additional work. Uh, the, the Every delegate agency uh, has to uh, come, part of the Head Start program requires a 25% uh, uh, in kind cost. Okay. okay? In okay. kind. However, that doesn't mean that a school district or a nonprofit might be doing more than that, but they do not report it. So we do not have the figures of everything that is given to the program. Uh, we only know what is reported to us. So the 25 percent then is reported in here. The 25 per. This is th these are the costs of the delegate agencies that we looked at. People were asking, so why is it that we have varying costs, and what are the costs that each delegate agency? is charging the program. That, that's what this particular document was created for. However, Madam Chair, the delegates do report on a monthly basis. They're in-kind each month. So we do have the in-kind that is being reported by each of the delegate agencies on a monthly basis, in addition to the cost that they're charging to the grant directly. So is there a possibility then to look at that and us be able to analyze the big picture? Yes. yes. Thank you. Right. Councilman Valenzuela. <laughs> you know, I have a couple questions, and I think I'll come back and probably have more questions because I didn't expect to ask these. This is a, a great chart, and uh, thank you for bringing it in. And it sounds like there's some rationale. For the first time, I think I'm hearing, um, I don't want to say for the first time, but, but something that's on a, a chart that we can go off of to look at the rationale on why there is a higher cost per child here as opposed to someplace else. Uh, and uh, before I ask my, my, actually I have a question that I, I just thought of. One, you know, uh, one school can afford, I'm sorry, I don't want to use that word. I want, I want staff uh, to tell me why some schools uh, are, are paying for services such as uh, field trips, health and safety supplies, 
mental health services, why some districts are paying for mental health services, health and safety supplies, and field trips for these children uh, in, in certain school districts. And, and, and now in, in one particular case, the city of Phoenix is, is, uh, is contributing more, adding to the cost per, per child, but to, it looks like to pick up some of these expenses. Why are some doing it and, and others? Yeah, Madam Chair, Councilman Valenzuela. Uh, yes, uh, what happens is every structure is different. And so and in a school district, there may be an opportunity for that school district to cover something because they have another program, because they've taken first things first funds. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of varying reasons. Uh, what we allow each delegate agency is to uh, outline their costs the way that they believe they need to run their program mm -hmm. appropriately. So uh, it could. there's just a lot of reasons why in one area they charge and in another area they don't. Uh, it just depends on structure, the other opportunities that they have in their area. It, it sounds like some are in a position to pay for these services and some are not. And in order to, in order to have this type of a service at the capacity at a Booker T. Washington, for example, then you need more money. You, you need more cost uh, per, per, per child. Um, because things like mental health services, health and safety supplies, and of course field trips. I mean, every kid deserves an opportunity to, to take in more culture than just what is around them. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. Um, so that's, that's the first thing I, I, I want to point out. And please feel free to, to correct me if I'm wrong. The other thing I'll, I'll mention also is uh, I want to thank Vice Mayor Michael Johnson for coming in and advocating again. It didn't surprise anyone that the man is here advocating. Uh, and you heard him advocate for Booker T. Washington, but children across the city of Phoenix. And that hasn't, that's never changed from the time I met Michael. I actually uh, I was fortunate to travel to D.C. with Michael to advocate for, uh, for this program. And when I say advocate, that first time it was me watching Michael advocate. And it was pretty impressive. And, and, and learning that and just uh, last year going with uh, Mayor Stanton and Deanna Janovich uh, so that we could uh, advocate uh, for this program uh, again. So th not that I have to remind our, our city staff, because I don't think I, I do at all, uh, but it's important to continue to be out there to advocate for this program. We need more federal funds. Mike Johnson, Vice Mayor Johnson mentioned that, uh, you know, we, we get less money per child here than what you would see across the board uh, in, in the country. So we have to continue to do that. Also, I know that this is just for information only, so the more discussion, the better. Whatever, whatever ends up happening, whatever changes may end up happening, I would ask that everyone continue with the communication and, uh, and what I would ask staff to do, maybe we're not there yet, uh, Chairwoman, but uh, whatever, whatever we end up doing, I, I think it's fair to have uh, some, some research done on how other cities are doing it. Is it always equal across the board? Uh, are they having the same issues we are having? I mean, are we, are we dealing with something that, um, that everyone else has been working with. Uh, just not to say that we have to do things the way anyone else does it, but it's good to, to have that information. And uh, we should all also come back, please, when you come back uh, to the subcommittee. I personally would like to see some phased in approaches as well, so that these changes are not done. And now everyone has to just figure that out, because how do you explain that to the kid? And, and if something has to be done, regardless of what it is, I think it needs to be in a methodical, phased in way. So, can I say something? Okay. So, uh, just for the record, this is a discussion, this is for information and discussion only. There's no action that is going to be, uh, we're, we're not taking action today. Uh, we're giving guidance to the staff as to what we would like to see before we take an action on this item. So just to be, let everybody know. 
Uh, Councilman Good, I see you standing. Uh, we'll get somebody to write a card up for you, right, Corey? Thank you. I hadn't planned to uh, speak, and certainly uh, the speaker for Booker T from our board uh, spoke and gave you some facts. I would invite you to come out to see the facilities at Booker T. Washington Child Development Center and uh, take a tour of it. All the time I was on the city council, I supported them, and I've been working with them for the, these many years. We did ask uh, Mr. Gallego to come out and, and sit down with our board who has legal responsibility. And two days before his scheduled visit, he indicated that uh, the city manager's office uh, requested that he not go. Well, I talked with the city manager and he is scheduled to come before us. We've also invited the mayor to come out. And certainly I would invite any of the board members to come out and take a look at our program that we've invested thousands of dollars in providing quality education for all of the kids. And I'm very proud of the parents who came today who spoke out in reference to what we're trying to do there for those children. I live two blocks from the program and I've been involved with it for all of these years. And certainly I think the recommendation that is being presented to you is not completely fair and does not include all of the facts in this case. Again, I would certainly welcome you to come out and sit down. It was my, when I was on the city council, whenever a citizen came to me, I thought that we ought to at least take a look at it and not, not uh, push us aside. So I invite you to come and I'll be there to, to assist you in seeing the fine facilities that we have, the quality education we have for these children in this part of the city. And I've lived there for 60 years and I think I know the community perhaps better than some of the others. Would you come? Thank you. Councilman Nowakowski. You know, first of all, I just want to thank our staff for all their hard work, and I know it was a difficult um, project. One of the things that we're looking at, just going back to the very beginning, is that there's some agencies that were actually receiving about um, $3,934 um, per student. There's other agencies that were receiving $6,948 um, per student. Some of the other agencies were, were here asking us, why aren't we getting our fair share? Why, why are some kids more valuable than other kids? And we said we don't value kids more from South Phoenix, North Phoenix, East Phoenix, or the East Valley. Or West Valley. Or West. <laughs> so basically, thank you. <laughs> so um, so I, we went out there and we did an evaluation. There were some nonprofits in the past. We had to make some hard decisions. And Mike was on, the, on this subcommittee with Golden Gate. Golden Gate's a fine example of a nonprofit that basically had to close their doors to head start. And uh, my thing is, staff, if we opened up this process and we looked at different methods, would the Golden Gates of the world and other nonprofits be able to submit for this um, allocation? Um, Madam. Uh, Chairwoman and uh, Councilman Alakowski, uh, yes, if we issued an RFP and opened up, you know, competition, if you will, uh, that is certainly possible in the example of Golden Gate. One of the things uh, about Golden Gate is their parent company. And uh, when you were, Councilman Valenzuela, when you were describing Booker T, one of the major differences is Booker T is a sole and separate Head Start agency as opposed to a parent company that ha has other funds. But uh, uh, certainly, you know, th this kind of, a, this would be a major change in the way that we operate. And certainly, uh, I, you know, I think that the community would be looking and, and there, that is possible. I'm a product of Head Start. I was a student of Head Start, I can't tell you how many years ago. I know how valuable that is to prepare, especially in our minority communities, our kids. And now with the standards that every third grader has to read a certain standard, it's even more important than ever but we only have allocations for so much money. And we have such a large city and people are coming to us. And you gotta put yourself on our situation here, is that everyone's saying we want our fair share. We go to Washington, D.C., I know that. Michael's been there, Danny's been there, and all of my colleagues fighting for our fair share for the state of Arizona. And that's what we're hearing from these other agencies. 
why aren't we having our fair share when it comes to allocations? So my recommendation would be, is there any way for us to look at maybe helping out Booker T. Washington with, with other funding, you know, because per student, I think we need to be fair across the board. But maybe there's some other ways of looking at helping out these nonprofits in some other way with the facility costs or so. That's not a part of this budget here, but maybe there's some grants in Washington that when you travel out there, Danny, you can look for some extra grants for nonprofits to cover their costs of operations. So this way we're all on the same playing field. And I think that's what we asked our staff to go out there to do. Make sure that everybody's on the same playing field, come up with some recommendation. These are just recommendations. We're, we're kind of ironing it all out right now. And basically they're going with class size and I like that. But at the same time, we have so many great nonprofits that are out there that need that extra help with the cost of their facilities and running their operations and all that, that maybe we need to start thinking outside the box on how to help those out. I mean, from 2010 or so, we used to have way more Head Start programs throughout the whole city of Phoenix. Now we're down to nine agencies. That's sad. It's really sad. We should have a Head Start program in every single school in, in the city of Phoenix. But once again, we're limited in funding. So I just wanna really make sure that people know that we're not going after Booker T or any um, of these agencies. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out a way to make sure that everybody gets their fair share and coming up with some kind of formula that all kids can benefit from it. So once again, if there's any type of grants that are out there that we can advocate, I mean, I would love to advocate with our congressional delegation and, and, and our federal de delegation to bring those funds back here to help out those nonprofits. Thank you. Councilman Valenzuela. Uh, thank you. I, I have made it, it's, it's no secret. I've, I've been to DC several times. I continue to travel to advocate for federal funds and uh, Councilman, I appreciate that. I, I do work uh, with nonprofits, and we are constantly, along with our very talented city staff, looking for those opportunities to better their, better the city of Phoenix. Uh, nonprofits are all of our partners, of course, the city uh, programs, and, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, as a council member for S Central and West Phoenix and, and school districts like Alhambra, if you think of those neighborhoods that are Christown Mall and Metro Center, uh, those neighborhoods in, in Maryvale. Uh, there's a lot of heart in those communities, and that's my home, and that's where I'm from, and I am the unapologetic advocate for this district. With that said, if anyone asked me why a school district like Booker T. Washington is receiving more than a school district elsewhere, my answer to that simple question is it costs more to run that program. It takes more to run that program. And we do care about every child in the city of Phoenix. And it just, it takes a little more funds to reach that child. Because that particular district needs, that child needs some assistance when it comes to programs such as mental health services health and safety supplies, field trips, and on and on and on. So that that child is getting the same experience as a child elsewhere throughout the city of Phoenix. It takes more. It, and, and frankly, it's worth it. It's worth every dime. So uh, that's, I, I, I'd like to give the doctor an opportunity if you're okay with that. Sure. Briefly respond to that. <coughs> you're saying that it cost more my position on that and as we were pointing out to you we don't know that it cost more there's more money from head start mm -hmm. budget paying more uh, for per child so the fact that those costs are incurred or uh, folded into a school district rather than to the parent agency doesn't mean that we we are actually spending more per child we just don't have other agencies to help but the grants and all the things that you're talking about would assist that. Oh, can I respond? So it sounds like, um, okay, I yeah. appreciate that. No, but, but yeah. please. 
but it's so it sounds like the it sounds like the, the number is probably the, the gap is probably a little more narrow than what it appears. Yeah. Because the city of Phoenix is also helping some of these other parent agencies and other. No. Is that what you're saying? No. City of Phoenix is not helping. <laughs> to my knowledge anyway. Okay. But um, with this, this is the federal dollars that are uh, allocated for Head Start are distributed based on the slots as has been indicated. But what you have on that chart are the actual cost for Booker T. Washington. You don't have all of the costs for the other programs because they've been paid by some other agency, we assume the school district. So that's why we don't know whether Booker T. Washington actually uh, charges more or uh, spending more per child than the other schools. That's I, why. I'm I saying. believe we. I believe we're on the same page. Yes. I, I think. Okay. We, what I'm saying is, and what I've been saying is, it, it probably costs a the same same amount yeah. across the board. I would guess. Similar. But, for, but yeah. for this program to work at Booker T. Yes. It costs more money because uh, of just as what funds. was indicated, some of these mm -hmm. programs. The the the, mm -hmm. mon the monies that Booker T. Washington requires to run this program right. to take care of certain things like mental health services, right. health and safety right. supplies, have to uh, be are, paid. Are, those have to be paid, just like they are paid elsewhere. Right. Uh, and Booker T. needs that assistance, whereas others may not. And that's right. that's where are okay. we on the same. Thank you. I just want to clarify because right. when we were, it sound like there was more spent per child no at I, across the board actually. and that's a good I, so yeah. when you come back yeah, i'd love to have that information as well across the board it sounds thank you very much it sounds like it's the same amount of money but to run this particular program it uh, so i think what councilman alkowski was saying um the the highest cost per child i think it uh, was just referring to the the amount of money the city of phoenix is putting towards this program as opposed to this program right right that the federal dollars that we receive. Yeah. Right. So I have one more um, speaker comment card, and that Zena Good. I apologize for sending my card late. Um, I just wasn't really planning on speaking, but after uh, my father-in-law, Councilman Good, spoke, I just wanted to share with you that and the time that he has um, spent working with um, Booker T. Washington, not one of his family members really has benefited from that program until now. Um, I foster a four-year-old boy who I've had in my home for 18 months, and he is now a student at Booker T. Washington Elementary, um, Booker T. Washington Head Start. He has, he started school there, um, at the beginning of the school year, he lost his mother in in February, and we took him to counseling. But a four-year-old really just cannot process those emotions at the level in which um, the therapist wanted him to process it. Boot five, which is his classroom, Miss Trish introduced a concept to him call, called a calm down corner. And it's just a little picture where he can go and breathe four different ways to overcome his anxiety. And just that simple thing, 50 years later, from all the work that was started in the basement first institutional, has benefited this child, this one child. And if that's all it ever does, that is worth extending this program another 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councilman Nowakowski? You know, once again, um, I want to thank um, Councilmember Johnson and also Mr. Good for their fight for this community. I mean, I hear you loud. I think what I like to do is I like to figure out a way where our staff can go out there and, and let's think outside the box on how to raise some more funding for um, Booker T. Washington because it's such a great facility. You all are providing a service that Garfield's not providing. So how can we maybe reach out to Garfield and say, can you help out with this? How can we reach out to the state and say, look it, there's a need for Head Start in this area, in the zip code area or whatever we need to do, and say that, can we get some special funding from the state or even at the federal level or at the county level or even here at, at the city, let's figure out. But I think what we're talking about here, and I don't want to mix things up, is that how do we make, how do we create a system going forward that's equal for everyone. 
that no matter where you live in the city of Phoenix, that it's equal. But at the same time, there's needs. There's needs in our community that there's certain areas that don't have those services. And the community has come up and built a beautiful center that's not just a Head Start center. It's a community center. It's a place where people come for help when they need food, when they need shelter, when they need just resources. The, you guys network them out. So it's more than just a Head Start center. I, I understand that. So how do we reach out to all those people that are benefiting from it, from the school districts that are benefiting from it because they don't have a Head Start program and they don't have those extra expenses? How can they give a little? How can the state give a little because they're not providing those services to those, that, those communities? How can the county and us as a city too? But let's think outside the box on how to do those kind of things. So I think I want to really compliment the staff because it's been hard. It's really hard to come up with some type of system going forward to making sure it's equal across the board. But now what we need to do is figure out a way to make sure that those communities that aren't represented well, and especially in, in our minority districts that a lot of it that I represent and some of my colleagues here represent, that we make sure we get our equal share of education for those kids and especially with the new um, standards we have of third grade reading, that they're prepared when they go to those schools. And we need to make sure that those school districts understand the importance, the importance of Head Start. And that what you all are doing at Broker T. Washington is benefiting their, their grades. They go out there and they brag about B plus, B, um, A plus schools, but at the same time, it's your preparation, preparing those kids to make sure that they get those, those grades, right? So I think we need to have a conversation outside with just the Booker T. Washington community and other, other communities that are out there that haven't been able to continue with the Head Start program because of their nonprofit um, status and the overhead that they have. And we need to really think outside of the box, not just for you all, but also other areas in our, in our city that really needs this for, for our students and for our kids. And once again, thank you, staff, for all your hard work. So thank you. I would like to see the 25% uh, cost, and then I would also like to see uh, the additional cost that they also put in. So, thank you. Excuse me. Uh, ¿me permite hablar? Rapidito. ¿Ya hablaste? Sí, pero solo es algo muy... Okay, está bien. Después de esto que escuché y todo eso... Um, ay, me ganan los nervios. No pido que le quiten a... Uh, Washington la, el dinero ni económicamente como están porque se está viendo que es un buen programa uh, me gusta la participación de sus papás pero también quiero lo mismo para mi escuela um, quiero las mismas oportunidades para mis niños I would like to have the same opportunities for my children and I don't want you to remove um, the, the funds for Washington um, it is a good program and I, would, I just want to have the same opportunities for my children. Tal vez Arizona es uno de los lugares más uh, bajos académicamente porque no estamos apoyando a todos, porque hay mucho discriminación. Quiero que todos los niños tengan las mismas oportunidades. I want all the children to have the same opportunities. And Arizona is the lowest uh, state that is lower academically. And I would like to have the same opportunities for everybody. No sé discrimination. No, si Washington is una buena escuela, sé que no puedo cambiar a mi hija para allá, porque nada más estaría cambiando la vida de un niño. Y si cambia y dan el ingreso para otras escuelas para que tengan las mismas oportunidades y los mismos ingresos que Washington, entonces estaríamos cambiando la vida de Washington. muchos niños. ¿Eh? That's Booker T. Washington. Oh, Booker T. Washington, sorry. Sí. Okay. Entonces estaríamos cambiando la vida de todos los niños, no solo de ellos, y todos nos estaríamos preparando a nuestros hijos para tener las mismas oportunidades. We all are preparing our children to have the same opportunities, and uh, Booker T. Washington is a good school. We would like to be there. Gracias. Y, y quiero dar las gracias a todos los padres que vinieron, porque de veras estos testimonios nos ayudan mucho, ¿no? Es que es tan importante escuchar de ustedes mismos porque están viviéndolo y sus hijos son parte del programa y nosotros muchas veces no podemos ir a conocer los diferentes programas de Head Start y es importante que ustedes vengan y que nos 
nos enseñan y nos hablan y okay. nos dan estos testimonios. I basically just told everybody, thank you for coming yeah. out and speaking up. It's so important to get input from the community themselves, no, especially parents on how these programs have changed their kids' lives. So once again, thank you for coming out. Don't ever be afraid to come out and let us know. Because a lot of times we can't go to the programs, but the programs, this is a chance for the programs to come to us and you guys tell your story. So thank you so much. Anyone else that would like to speak, please fill out a yellow card. Uh, we are trying to, as soon as uh, Mr. Mason, it, if there's nobody else, he will be the last speaker. My name is yeah. Ananias Mason. Uh, I was a little, little reluctant to speak because I did not want to duplicate. But I'm the former principal of Booker T. Washington School and Emerson School. And I fully know the importance of what Head Start means to our system. And I, I couldn't sit down with, with not making that statement. It does make a difference. I, uh, I've been a part of this board for practically 35 years. Don't let us down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all your work. Uh, I made a mistake. <laughs> As all of us do. You're human, huh? Yes, I am human. Uh, there are three other items, and we are going to hear the Phoenix Great. IDA and Charter School funding. Items, item 11 and 12, we are going to continue. So those staff that are, that are here, uh, you're more than welcome to stay to listen to the lively dialogue or uh, I think there's other items you can do in the office. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm Chairwoman Pastor and subcommittee members. We have our, well, we've got a panel here with Neil Young, our Chief Financial Officer, Juan Salgado with the Phoenix IDA, he's Executive Director, Alan Stevenson, our Planning and Development Director, and then Ray Dovalina, our Acting Street Transportation Director, here to talk about the Phoenix IDA and charter schools, and we'll, I guess, take a few moments while people. Uh, gracias a todos que vinieron y uh, vamos a seguir. Gracias. Um, we are speaking on item 13, Phoenix IDA and charter school funding. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Earlier this year, the uh, subcommittee had asked a number of questions uh, relative to charter school compliance uh, requirements with zoning enforcement and site plan reviews. Uh, the IDA and uh, Juan and our Planning and Development and Streets Transportation Department spent a lot of time this summer going over uh, those issues. And uh, we're here today to uh, present the results of our review. And I'm going to turn over to Juan Salgado for a brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yang. I work on pressing the number here. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thanks for having us here this morning. Uh, my name is Juan Salgado. I am the Executive Director for the Phoenix IDA. Um, thank you again for having us uh, discuss this item with you today. Uh, before I get started on, on our section of the presentation, I'd like to ask Mr. Alvin Stevenson, who is the Director of Planning and Development, to discuss the current the state legislation regarding public school exemption from municipal zoning ordinances uh, including site review, and then the department guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, a few years back, Arizona State legislation was passed, uh, ARS 15-189, that requires 
cities to treat uh, charter schools the exact same as they do for public schools. Um, and so what that means from a zoning ordinance perspective is that they're exempt from requirements for the zoning ordinance. They do not go through a site plan review process. Um, the city of Phoenix allows public schools uh, in any of our residential zoning districts. Therefore, we have to allow charter schools in any of those same districts. Um, when they go through the, the development process, all they uh, really have to require to meet is fire and building code requirements for life safety. Uh, they do not have to meet uh, other requirements like uh, storm water management, grading and drainage. Um, those are the, they just have to focus on fire and life safety um, issues in the building code, just like public schools do. So that has created uh, some issues with the surrounding community who I think at times doesn't understand uh, that charter schools are not treated like a business. They're treated just like a public school from the zoning ordinance perspective. And so uh, their things are a little more permissive with them. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to John or is it going to, to Ray? To Ray. Ray's gonna talk about the streets. So just following up on the, the same uh, comments that Alan has stated, uh, there's been a couple of schools, several schools that have opened up in the last couple of years. And as you can see there, there's 42, 43 new school campuses in Phoenix in 2010. Uh, a lot of them are elementary schools. And a couple of things that they don't, as, as Alan mentioned, um, they don't follow a lot of the requirements that we have to do for any other type of development. So uh, zoning ordinances, uh, transportation uh, impact studies, uh, infrastructure standards, they are required to still provide right away if they're connecting to an existing street, things of that nature, uh, street light, there's things that they still need to do that, uh, but there's things that, like a traffic impact study, they don't have to do that. So what happens after the, 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 uh, the site is developed, then the community comes to us, uh, to our department, to the city, and says, hey, there's this new school, what's happening? And so we have challenges in kind of moving forward with how, how do we address that where things were not addressed during the development side of those schools? And just to finish it off with, some of these schools have, have gotten uh, Phoenix um, assistance or from the IDA um, funding. Thank you, Madam Chair. To... Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to, to follow up Mr. Dovelina's comments um, in your packet this afternoon or this morning, uh, you will see that the uh, Phoenix IDA was involved in assisting nine of the 43 schools that uh, are uh, identified here. And, and just for purposes of discussion, new school openings really reflect schools that have opened during that particular time. So in, in some cases, these schools have moved from another location to this location, so they're part of the 43. Now, uh, when these schools open, they can either get financing from uh, district bonds if it's a district school uh, or they can get from a c commercial bank uh, n private nonprofits and foundations uh, or as in the case with uh, our involvement uh, IDAs now in this particular case uh, other IDAs that were involved in financing uh, part of the 43 were from Pima Yavapai and the Florence IDA now for the purposes of today's discussion uh, if you look at your the list of schools that you have in your packet, as we uh, tried to define uh, construction, uh, a lot of the schools that we're involved with uh, are schools that are either adding uh, a facility, uh, a building, administration, so we really don't know the impact sometimes that it will have on, on traffic issues. Uh, the other is that uh, uh, we've been involved with schools that are buying existing commercial buildings and they're retrofitting. For example, the most recent one was based at Schools Central, which purchased the old FBI building and then they converted it to school. Uh, out of all the schools that uh, we financed, the nine, there's only one that exactly was, that essentially was involved in construction from the ground up. That was the Phoenix Collegiate Academy in South Phoenix. Uh, we're also involved in a lot of the schools in refinancing. Uh, uh, existing loans that, that exist. So uh, that rounds out the nine that, that we're involved with um, in, uh, in, that, in that particular order. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the Phoenix IDA uh, and some background about who we are. You know, IDAs were formed under the Industrial Development Act of 1968. Uh, in 1981, the Phoenix IDA was incorporated as a nonprofit corporation, and in accordance with the IDA Act, uh, it functions as an independent political subdivision of the state of Arizona. 
Now, IDAs serve a purpose as a conduit issue of private activity bonds for the benefit of private users to finance generating, uh, uh, revenue generating projects that provide a public benefit. Now, we've come before you as we have before our board. Uh, these bonds are backed by the credit of the borrowers uh, or the collateral of the facility, or in some cases there's a pledge, for example, letter of credit from the bank to the bondholders who are involved with uh, financing these projects. Uh, over since January of 2009, we have issued a little over a billion dollars in revenue bonds. And so that's been a significant impact for this particular community. Uh, out of that, fees that we receive uh, to operate uh, the Phoenix IDA, over the last three, three fiscal years, we've invested uh, about three, over $600,000 to local nonprofits. And if you take a look at the match that we uh, are involved with, and we match a lot of our dollars, uh, we've invested probably well over a million dollars during that period of time. Uh, this coming fiscal year, uh, the board has committed to invest uh, all of the non-Arizona projects, which is about $320,000 in revenue, to local nonprofits supporting Phoenix. In fact, we recently announced that uh, we are joining uh, the Arizona Community Foundation and have taken 250,000 of that 320 and leveraged it for another $250,000. So now we have half a million dollars that are going to support local nonprofits in this community. Uh, and I think what's important to note that the uh, Phoenix IDA is self-supporting. Uh, we have a total of six full-time employees, uh, five are IDA employees. And all the fees that are generated by the IDA support the organization. We have no taxpayer assistance. And uh, in fact, when we come before the city council, we'll reimburse the city clerk for any uh, expenses that we incurred you know, during the process. Um, and uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the diligence process. Now, uh, as you know, uh, a bond is a loan. So part of the process involves is underwriting the transaction. So when the time a, a, a project comes before us, uh, it usually has a team, a financing team that has essentially vetted the project or is vetting the project uh, on whether the project can support repaying its debt. As I mentioned earlier, that the revenue bonds need to have revenue coming in to be able to support and pay the bondholders. So we're involved in that process. Uh, the IDA works very closely with the financing team in making sure that these projects are feasible, you know, for the community. Uh, other areas that we look at are the quality of schools that are being considered by the IDA. And I am proud to say that uh, all the schools we finance, I think there's a total of about, uh, if I may, real quickly here, a majority of the schools that we finance uh, most recently, in fact, uh, 18 have received grade A, uh, 1B, uh, 4C and 1D and 3 are no ratings. So the schools that we're involved with are providing quality education can you in that this one community. You, Mr. Sagar, can you just mention 18A? Uh, uh, 1B, uh, 4C, and uh, 1D. And the rest are no ratings because they're, they just opened up recently. And so those are the things that we consider. And by way of, of neighborhood factors, uh, whenever a school approaches us and submits an application, and if it's in a particular district, we contact the council staff to find information about a project and where there's any controversial issues. We have uh, not pursued uh, financing any projects if there are problems in the neighborhood uh, with that particular project. So uh, by the time that uh, my board of directors uh, has an opportunity to consider approval of resolution and before you see it, the project being well vetted in terms of the community uh, perspective as well as the uh, financing of the project. Um, the next slide, which I think second and last, I want to talk a little bit about the financing options. Um, in reality, we're looking at, uh, as we mentioned earlier, when we're talking about public schools, we're talking about both district and charters. District schools today have two ways to uh, finance their projects, uh, either through their issuing their own bonds, uh, or secondly, uh, talking to IDAs uh, like uh, we are and, and essentially go through the private market to do that. Now, a couple years ago, uh, we were the first uh, IDA to issue uh, bonds for the Higley School District where they financed two campuses. And so that model is a new model that other districts, the Higley School District, and so they financed two campuses. And so other uh, districts are looking at that model and we've had several conversations about taking that approach versus issuing their own bonds. And charter schools, uh, 
have uh, the ability to either use uh, private investors, uh, national or local foundations, commercial banks, or as we're seeing a lot of is that they're doing build to suit uh, lease to owns. That's why we see a lot of finances because they seek uh, to build a facility, they lease it for a period of time, and then once that the school has been established uh, in the neighborhood uh, and the enrollment is, is good, then they come to us seeking longer term financing where the capital markets will look more favorably at uh, financing those schools. So what I want to do is to give you a, a broad overview of essentially the, the process that's involved uh, with the IDA. And I know that the concerns were raised earlier about traffic safety and site review. So uh, as Mr. Young mentioned in his comments, uh, we spent all summer working very closely with uh, both planning and streets and identifying uh, what the uh, uh, issues were. And so uh, the information we've presented to you today is uh, for your consideration, obviously, for, for questions. So this uh, pretty well concludes uh, my uh, comments. You know, I was, I was one of the people that were very concerned about a new charter school in the Zolvin area um, because of the um, building height limitations and stuff like that. There's no limitations if it's a charter school or a public school. So people from the Levine area came and started calling saying, what the heck's going, being built here? You know, it's the highest structure in South Phoenix. Um, they didn't go through the village. They didn't go through our planning and zoning. So we had no idea what was going on. So one of the things that we wanted to find out is that if our Phoenix IDA were one of the funding sources to see if there was some type of restrictions or anything that we can do if they were using our own funding source. Since that, we've had several meetings. And one of the things that I learned was, well, if they don't get the funding from us, they'll probably just jump to another city or another IDA and get the funding there. It's just like a bank. If you don't get funding from Wells Fargo, you jump to Bank of America, and you just keep on going till you find that funding source. I think the root of the problem isn't where the funding source is. It's at the state level. Mm -hmm. And I believe that what I like to do is, as a city of Phoenix, I would like to really look at this year and changing that, that there be some type of respect for the communities that public schools and charter schools are going to be built and that they go through some type of a process where they go through the village so they can actually listen and hear the people that live in that community, the, the advocates, the community leaders, the neighborhood block watch leaders, all those individuals that we have appointed to those, those villages are representing that community that those buildings are being built in. The other thing is that I believe they should go through our planning and zoning also. Because, I mean, when we talk about height, we talk about um, building um, setbacks, that we're building a master plan. And I believe that the school should be a part of this master plan when it comes to all those planning and zoning and offsets and, and how to basically put their building. I mean, there's no offset. They can actually be right in somebody's backyard looking in because there's, they actually don't have to go through the process. So those, that's one of the things that I like to see coming out of this um, discussion is somehow, some way that we as a city of Phoenix can advocate at the state level to make those changes because I don't think we can really twist it at the IDA level because the funding source will just go somewhere else and the problem will still exist. So Alan, we are doing this general master plan. <laughs> And in this whole, I'm just now thinking, uh, and all our communities are together and discussing, you know, everything that could possibly happen within that community. How are, and school districts are involved. I know public school districts, but I'm not sure where charter is involved. And so how are they getting a voice within this, this general master plan or this general plan? So, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the, the general plan update is, is ongoing uh, right now, as you noted. It, it's a uh, big picture at this point, so it is not something that, um, that has yet evolved to the stage where the villages are really going to, to dive into a, a more refined master plan. That is something that's coming up after we get through this next wave of public involvement this fall, and then it gets scheduled for the, for the ballot. We will be working with the villages to kind of update their village plan. 
but we want to first set these big picture goals that we're seeking additional input this fall on. And once that gets set, we'll ask the villages uh, to work with public schools, charter schools, neighbors, and businesses to then refine their village plan based upon those larger set of goals. So that way they can add their particular uniqueness to it from that big picture perspective. Okay. So um, I agree with you, Councilman Nowakowski, that we probably should all sit down or sit with Tom Remus and, and our intergovernmental team and uh, see what we need to start doing. Um, it's probably going to take us a good five years, um, but <laughs> we'll get there. Um, we probably <laughs> only five with you, with your, yeah, with your help. Yeah, with your help, wearing. My help, seven. <laughs> uh, I also feel like we need to talk to uh, the charter associations and uh, start having this dialogue with them um, before they think we're anti-charter or all this other dynamic that I end up getting back because I ask questions. Um, and also uh, work with our public school systems because they're going to be also being part of this because it, I think it's both systems. Exactly. And so um, I would like to, I guess, put that on our agenda for Tom to come in and, and work with us. All right. Oh, I know. I want to know what else IDA funds other than charter. What other? be happy to in fact I uh, I uh, prepared uh, and if I'm, I'm not this is I'm a kind of rookie at this so if I violate protocol we can blame mr. mr. young for inviting me here we'll let you know immediately Juan if you violate. That, that, thank you uh, I, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, briefly just a quick snapshot of our portfolio uh, in terms of transactions that uh, we're involved with and so if I may What I um, am uh, sharing with the with the with Madam Chair and the committee members is a uh, snapshot of our current portfolio um, as it relates to uh, our activity from January 2009 through August uh, 2014. Uh, as you can uh, see, uh, the large portion uh, of our activity is with education, and within education. Uh, we're looking at uh, not only charter schools, but I mentioned earlier district schools. Uh, we're also involved in providing uh, schools for uh, financing for private schools that we have, as well as um, as uh, yeah, higher ed. Uh, the uh, health care uh, is uh, also an area which is about 11 percent of our portfolio. Uh, as you recall, uh, council was uh, nice enough to support uh, uh, our project uh, in vice mayor uh, Waring's district and financing the Mayo uh, expansion of the Proton facility, which is about 182 million. Uh, healthcare has become a priority for the Phoenix IDA, and we're working with and continue to work with lo local hospital and reg regional centers as they continue to expand. Uh, our, our largest uh, activity besides education, as you see, is housing, uh, which is a, represents about 31% of our portfolio. That number includes a significant success that we've had in providing single family down payment assistance for residents uh, within Maricopa County. Uh, that number, I think, has generated over almost close to 3,000 families. Is that right? And provided almost close to $18 million in, in, uh, in, in down payment assistance. And then the other smaller ones are manufacturing. We haven't done a lot of that. And that's been because the legislation has made the definition so narrow that we just not had uh, the ability to provide more of that Solid waste um, is uh, some facilities that we financed uh, with Glendale. We're in conversations right now with Public Works on considering assisting with financing to other projects. So that uh, gives you a, a overview of, of, of where we are as far as, as priorities. Uh, as I mentioned, healthcare uh, is on top of our list. Uh, we'll continue to work with education, uh, but focusing uh, more so uh, with district uh, schools and um, and uh, higher ed. Thank you. And Any other questions? No, if I, uh, I, I like to make a comment, and I uh, would ask the, uh, my apology of my board chair and my uh, treasurer who have joined us here today, if I may ask uh, Don, Mr. Don Cute and Ms. Krista Severance, who uh, have been very supportive 
of the Phoenix IDA. And so uh, they've joined us uh, here today to show support of, of our organization as well as uh, members of my team. Thank you for being here. <laughs> like to say any words? <laughs> okay. Well, Don's not going to speak. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we need to put that in the minutes. That's historic right now. Thank you, gentlemen, for all your hard work. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't think we have anything else. All right. As you know, item 11 and 12 have been continued to the next meeting. It is now item number 14, call to the public. Don't have any cards. Any requests for future agenda items? Meeting adjourned. All right.